Episode six of Eyes on Liberty is with Tom Karadza, co-founder of Rockstar Real Estate based in Toronto. We'll get into the unique scenarios of the Canadian housing market, the evidence of Bitcoin as a necessary solution for preserving purchasing power, and the cultural byproduct of bringing hard money back to the world. If you're a realtor, mom, this one's for you. But also if you recognize that there's no real solution to this legacy system and you must move into another one for survival. You find those who have not had freedom uh, and not in a position to define freedom, they're beginning to define it for themselves now. And as they get in a position intellectually to define freedom for themselves, they see that they don't have it. And it makes them less peaceful. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. Monetary debasement is out of control. Runaway debt like an animated snowball. The only question is, do you want to take the steps to get out of the way? Or do you become a casualty to parasitic greed? Tom Karadza from Rockstar Real Estate. You know, it's funny. We Normally, the guests on my show, I have the opportunity to know them in person and you're probably one of the first maybe the second where i didn't um didn't get a chance to the privilege to to meet initially before you came on the show you met my my lead john from uh from money matters from coin beast so first of all how are you and second of all i want to kind of get the story of how you met him in the first place yeah, he's an interesting character. I was uh, so thank you, thanks for being here. I really appreciate being here. Um, I was at the Canadian Bitcoiners Conference in Montreal, and I think I was talking to someone else. Someone was quizzing me about why we run a real estate brokerage and why we also talk about Bitcoin all the time. Like, how how do those two fit together? And I was explaining our beliefs in Bitcoin and real estate, and uh, this guy just kind of like. I think he just interjected himself in the conversation as far as I can remember, remember. And he was asking me a few more questions. And then he said, Oh, I really think you need to speak to Ulrich. Like I'm just going to connect you to, and would you just go on his podcast and just explain what you just explained to me? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, he seemed like a good guy. I didn't know who you were at the time. Um, and that was it. So it was really random before I knew it. Uh, an email came from you and, and here we are. So, uh, it, it was kind of random. I really appreciate his hustle, though. He he was out there. He was he was getting guests for you. He was looking for guests. So I appreciate it. Oh my gosh! You know it's funny. I I want to, you know, I want to take a picture with my wife sometimes. And when we're out, and it's like, oh, we should take a picture. We have so many pictures where I take one of her and she takes one of me. And she said we should find someone to take a picture with us. And when she says that, she means I should find someone to take a picture <laughs> of us. And I'm like, you know they look so busy, you know, maybe we should just leave them alone. And it's like, we, and she thinks the same way, but she doesn't, but she doesn't want to voice it. So she gets mad. Like, you don't want to take a picture of me. I'm like, okay. So John is the type that's like, he'll, he'll go up and say, you know, Hey, how's it going? I want you to hear from me. So it's interesting. So he was so enthralled by what you were saying. If you don't mind, if you do, if you remember, what were you talking about when, when he ran into you? Um, yeah, the discussion was basically we run this brokerage out in, on the west side of Toronto called Rockstar Real Estate with the whole premise being add assets to your life um, and let's try to use those assets to live your life on your terms. So we kind of have this model, your life, your terms. Like, what are we all doing? We're all running in circles. We're all working. We all went to school. We all got a job. Nobody feels like they're living life on their own terms. They all feel like they're a hamster running in this wheel. What's this all about? And then in 2008, I kind of to quit my tech job. I was at a database company called Oracle for seven years and then a company called NetSuite for two years. And I quit that to start Rockstar Real Estate with my brother because we realized that the rental properties that we were buying from about the year 2000 were getting us ahead financially faster than anything else we were doing. We both had high paying jobs in tech, 
but these rental properties were spitting off cash flow and they were appreciating rather aggressively. Canada has had like this weird, crazy multi-decade run in real estate. And we just decided to quit our job and help other Canadians buy real estate to put assets in their lives to help them get ahead financially. So our brokerage isn't really about you know, real estate as the raw, raw best thing ever. It's just like we discovered that, wow, real estate allows people to outpace the debasement of the monetary system going on in Canada and around the Western world. And we didn't know there was no Bitcoin at the time. We started this in 2007 and we decided that we'd help other Canadians try to outpace the debasement. And we couldn't articulate it as well as we can articulate it now, but there was just this understanding that like, wow, you have two or three rental properties. They tend to go up, you know, on leverage, you put 20% down in Canada on a property or in the U S on average, they go up 7% a year. Now we, you know, Ulrich, you probably know as well as I do, the 7% a year is the debasement of the currency, but you buy the property, it goes up 7% a year. If you put 20% down, and that asset is going up 77% a year on average over time, 7% against your 20% down payment is a 35% gain on your 20% down payment. That 35% gain is outpacing the inflation that we're all living with. So the leverage of the real estate is really the only beautiful thing of becoming a real estate investor. All the other aspects of real estate are kind of painful, but the leverage outpaces the inflation that we're all dealing with. So it's kind of this like magical thing. And that's what we started helping Canadians with. We started this brokerage called Rockstar Real Estate. It was just myself and my brother. Now there's about 40, 50 of us here at Rockstar. And we work with Canadians right across the greater Toronto area um, to buy properties. And they've bought billions of dollars in properties since we kind of started. And then in the year, I'm just going to keep going until you cut me off. Then just in the year to, uh, the pandemic hit, and I had dismissed Bitcoin. Like I literally laughed at Bitcoin for years. Um, I remember one guy told me in like 2017 about Bitcoin. And I kind of said, what are you talking about? Like, we'll just start the rock star coin. Like, how about that? We'll just start the rock star coin. Like, you know, stop talking to me about your fancy Bitcoin. And then in 2020, I opened up the Bitcoin standard by Saifedean. I read the first four chapters. I put the book down after the fourth chapter, page 72. I ran to my brother's office. You're in our office here. I ran to his office and I said, Nick, holy shit. Um, I screwed us. I don't, uh, we should be buying this stuff. And then we allocated into Bitcoin. You know, when you go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, you think you need a little bit. And then we allocated a little bit of Bitcoin and I, and I thought, okay, I got a bit of Bitcoin. And then after that, went down the rabbit hole a little bit more and realized, holy smokes, we're not even close. So in 2020, um, that's when I got orange pilled pretty hard. And since then we've been talking to about to real estate investors that we work with about allocating some percentage of their investment portfolio to Bitcoin. And it's been a hard journey. I'm not going to lie, convincing people to add Bitcoin to their lives and their portfolios and to mix it in with real estate has been, it's been difficult to try to convince people. Let's stop right there. I have a, I have a couple questions. So that's interesting that you say that you say that, um, but I want to go back pull back a little bit because he's talked about the, the, the pace of the Canadian real estate market. Um, and again, this is hearsay. This is other people telling me this. I, I know what the market is like in Los Angeles, desirable place to live, of course, um, and generally the U S but allegedly Canada has had even a more rapid growth. You're, if you're in Toronto, you probably see the most lucrative gains, um, from an asset to fiat perspective, but what do you think is driving the, shall we say, bubble in Canada um, to outpace even the United States? Yeah, I think America. So my American friends don't don't understand this until we explain it. Is that Canada? Um, we get a ton of immigration in this country. We always have. And in the last few years, we ramped it up even further. And unlike the United States, we don't have a dozen cities for people to go choose to live in. In Canada, most people land here. They're going to live in Montreal, Toronto, or maybe hold on. Let me guess. Let me guess. So Montreal, Toronto. I was going to say those. Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. Calgary. Yes. 
Okay. And, and then go and then there, there. Yeah. There. What's next? <laughs> what's next? I'm uh, you. Uh, you did great with four. Winnipeg. You did great. Uh, oh my gosh. No. No. Okay. No. The Winnipeg I love Jets. People in I don't Winnipeg. know. I love, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yes. But it's cold. It's very right cold. Okay. It's very cold. <laughs> so um, I'm sure there's wonderful people up in Winnipeg, um, but uh, but that's the, our reality. Is that really we don't have all the we're not there's no Chicago, New York, there's spots in New Jersey, there's Florida, there's Texas. You're going to go to the Carolinas, you can go to L.A., you can go to Seattle, you know, Arizona. We don't have all these choices. So we get a lot of immigration. And even if someone lands in Winnipeg, to use your example, because we have clients who th they did this. They're from the Philippines. They came to Canada. They landed in Winnipeg. They looked around. And they said, we're out of Winnipeg. We're coming to Toronto. So even if Canada does like a, a tries to distribute the immigration, you know, um, and my parents are immigrants, right? My father's a refugee from a small country called Croatia. My mom is an immigrant from Scotland. Um, so, you know, they landed in Toronto. It's just like, this is how Canada's built. So then what you have is you have a lot of immigration landing in very few population centers. And there's a structural imbalance between the housing supply and the demand. The supply just has not kept up with the demand. So even if immigration is distributed across the country, it congregates around these few centers. We don't have enough homes. Then there's another factor. So because that's maybe equivalent to the U.S. that doesn't have enough homes. The, the factor that most, most Americans miss is that our interest rates in Canada are always slightly lower than the U.S., so if you guys are getting a, an interest rate at 4%, we're probably getting mortgages at 3%. You know, when the pandemic hit and rates came way, way down, we were getting mortgages as low as 1.99%. So if we are continually having mortgage rates lower than the US, remember, people only buy properties based on the monthly payment. So if our rates are going to be less than American rates, we can push the asset value higher because people are really just buying the monthly rate. They're just buying that monthly payment. And if our interest rates are going to be lower than yours, and our interest rates have to be lower than yours because we are an export-based economy, Canada does not want its currency to be stronger than the American currency. So we always want our rates. I'm not saying this is right. But there's this unsaid rule here that we always want the Canadian dollar to be weaker than the American dollar. That's our competitive advantage. It's ridiculous, but that's how it works. And because of that, we always keep our rates slightly lower and our mortgage rates are going to be slightly lower at all times than American uh, mortgage rates. And because of that, it just pushes asset prices. If we have, you know, when I say slightly lower, if your rates are three and ours are two, we're 33 percent. That's what people don't understand. They, they they look at it, it's like, oh, it's just one percent. No, it's the difference. Like you take that that big number. That's the denominator. Now, what's the difference between that? And that's why it's like the interest rates, we don't realize, like even with the interest rates adjusting 50 BPS and with the Fed just recently, people don't realize that that's a 10% that's a change in what people, what the ultra rich are getting with their treasuries. So imagine you losing 10% of your daily income or your monthly income. Uh, you're going to say, that's not enough. I got to go invest in something else. And that's why you saw the uptick in so many tech stocks and Bitcoin and things that are considered high risk. Like we just, people don't, and I think pointing to the book behind you, I think that's the price of tomorrow. Uh, those are the kind of things that get into the law of exponentiality that Jeff Booth talks about that people just don't realize. And they don't realize until they're looking at the, at it on the other side. It's like, oh, wow, look at all those gains. I wonder where that came from. It's, it's just math. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've just had exactly this happening here for a long time. Like we were getting rates, we were doing 40 year amortizations on our mortgages. We had low rates starting from the great financial crisis. I mean, there was a, we didn't, we didn't have any, we have not had reasonably high rates here until the last two years. So we've had like 15 years. The last big real estate correction in Canada was 1990 to 96, where real estate prices ground down for six years. Since 1996 till about two years ago, to 2017, there was a tiny little, uh, little adjustment in real estate prices and then it kind of corrected. But we went through multiple decades with no real estate correction. So like you guys had the real estate correction after the great financial crisis, we didn't have that. So we just ripped for multiple decades. So then in the society, you have this thing where people just believe real estate prices go up forever. 
So it's just embedded in here. I mean, if you're under, I'm 51, if you're under 40 years and uh, 40 years old and real estate prices have been going up for like 30 years, like you just haven't, you haven't. That's all you've known. That's all you've known. So it's created this thing that's just like this never ending story. And then the structural imbalance of lack of housing and high immigration. And we really ramped our immigration like the entire Western world. We really ramped our immigration. Our population is small. So we have 40 million people here total in the country. So if you really ramp the immigration on a per capita basis, you can really smash the population growth numbers here really aggressively without much difficulty that puts a lot of pl- pressure on the real estate market. You know, what? it's so funny that you mentioned this, this generational bias, this generational perspective. You know, I think of two examples. First of all, I think of 1984, where people just have short-term memory loss um, and they, they erase history because people don't know how to remember past what happened last week. Uh, but then, but then I think about you know the the uh, the theory of the the turnings, the fourth turning, where it's like, and I, ha- I just interviewed uh, Brandon Quidham from Swan, and we go in depth about the fourth turning. People who are watching this episode probably saw the episode before, um, but it's like, why does it take eighty years for bad things to happen? Well, it's likely because people who were alive last time something bad happened a world war a civil war um they those people who were alive then they're not alive now so history kind of the bad parts of history tend to repeat itself because it's like oh what's the worst that can happen how about bloodshed and and wanton violence everywhere and so i think when it comes down to the the more the housing bubble slash crisis um because when prices are going up that high it's obviously a crisis for some people and a bubble for others it's like you talked about a whole generation of people. They just expect it to go up forever, Laura, to quote Sailor. But the thing is, is that if you actually pick up a book, these things don't go on forever. Nothing essentially goes on forever. No. And just to give you perspective, because I think sometimes it's nice to hear other markets for any any of your listeners, like in outside of uh, Toronto, there's a town called Hamilton, Ontario. To get a good home in Hamilton, Ontario in 2007 was like 200,000 bucks. Now you're looking at 850 to $1.1 million. This is Hamilton, Ontario. This is not Toronto. In a the town. suburb, on, yes, on the suburb west side of, of Toronto, where I am right now, you can easily get properties, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, 6 million, so, you know, the property prices in Toronto and when people think, oh, property prices are out of whack, that is what you're dealing with. And nominally, nominally, I think those prices are going to go higher, not against Bitcoin. I just mean in dollar to Canadian dollar terms. But you, you also brought up one thing I really want to address about how, how people kind of takes when something's not in their recent memory, how they don't understand what can be coming next? You know, I mentioned my father is a refugee from Croatia. You know, he got out into Austria. They didn't want to keep him and the church paid for a boat ticket for him to get to Canada. And he came to Canada, wanted to leave Canada, had no money, the whole story, whole immigrant story. And, you know, met my mom here and, and my, my brother and I were born. Um, but my father in that country, um, he had relatives. And when I, when I, we went back and, you know, we have a place there now and we go there every summer with the family on the Adriatic coast. It's beautiful, by the way. You should go to Croatia and you should visit Croatia. The Adriatic coast is absolutely stunning. But my uncle there told told me something. He said, listen, he's since passed away. uh, But he said, listen, this country used to be full of educated, hardworking people. When socialism came in here, he goes, we were the engineers. We went to Iraq. We worked on the oil fields there. We were the engineers who would craft some of the oil projects that were developed in some of these oil generating countries. When socialism came into this country, it came in slowly, but over time, five years, 10 years, 15 years, the next generation started to get handouts. And when they started to get handouts, the value of going to get an education and then to get a hard, uh, get a job that would um, pay them for their hard work, that diminished. And that people just wanted more and more handouts. Less people got educated because we were a very, very educated population. 
And it took 40 years that he saw it with his lifetime from going where everybody was hardworking and well-educated to everybody complaining about their pensions that weren't enough and putting their hands out wanting for more free things. During that process, my father went to jail because he sang the wrong song in that country. He sang a song that wasn't approved by the Communist Party there. They put him in jail for two weeks in one beach town there um, just for singing a song. So no free speech, sang, said the wrong words, went to jail. My aunt, and I went with her to these markets, she sold eggs in the market in a town called Split right on the Adriatic coast. And in the 1980s, she was selling eggs. But during that time, the dinars were losing value very quickly because the, the country wasn't producing any value anymore because of all the socialist policies. So the government prints more and more dinars. What happens? Inflation. The dinars lose value. On the side of selling eggs in the market in this little town called Split on the Adriatic coast, she was exchanging dinars for German marks. There was this market where people were like, hey, I want out of my dinars. Some illegal German marks got into the country. She's, she's, making, she's hustling. She's making a commission on selling dinars for German marks that people aggressively want on the side. You can't, you can't publicly say that you're exchanging that. That's against the Communist Party. She gets caught doing that. My aunt goes to jail for four months just because she was trying to help people protect their purchasing power. She went to jail for four months. All she was doing was exchanging dinars that was not approved by the government for German marks for people to try to protect their purchasing power. So when I see people in Canada, and I can't, I'm not in the US, but you know, the US is, the media is strong. We see what's going on in the US. And I see some of these trends going on in the US. I'm like, I don't think people really understand that when we're talking about like what you can and can't say, you know, there is that quote, I, I can't repeat it well here, but you know, I'll fight. I might not agree with what you're saying, Ulrich, but I'll fight for your right to say it. It's like, yeah, that's the world I want to live in. Do we want to put people into jail for saying something that they just don't agree with? And then on the purchasing power, my aunt went to jail for four months, but all she did was help people protect their purchasing power. So some of the things I see in the Western world right now bother me. And some of the things I see in Canada bother me. And that's why here at Rockstar, our mission is your life, your terms. And it's why we are talking about Bitcoin to real estate investors, because we're like the issues that are present, that are a threat to our future generation's freedom are real. And if we don't take these things seriously, the path that we are on is a slippery slope. And I've seen it in my own family's history. So to come here now and people say, oh, well, Tom, it's like, why are you getting all up in arms about all this stuff? Like, it's not that big of a deal. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe it's not big of a deal right now to you now. Maybe you've done well in the current system. You've saved a lot of money. You've worked on Wall Street and Bay Street and you have some assets. But the destruction of the middle class in this country is very real. In America, it's very real. Asset owners are winning. Incomes are not keeping up. And Bitcoin to presents hope to me. It presents a better future to me. And I like that world and it gets me excited about it. So anyway. Right on. No, oh, no. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. And, you know, like on my show, look, when you want to riff, you can riff. Because you know, I, <laughs> I tell you, I'll take, the, I'll take the mic as well. Here's the mic right here. I'll take it and I'll go on my, hold on, let me get my little 45 seconds in. And I, and you, I get 45 seconds, you get three minutes. And then, and then all of a sudden, we've talked about just what we want to talk about. The hour goes, but the hour goes by fast when you're talking about what you want to talk about. But I think we both want to talk about Bitcoin. And, and my next question is, you know, with you being in real estate, again, Bitcoin is a great protector for the middle class, but a lot of people who are own assets aren't middle class. They're, they're, they're upper middle class, they're upper class, they're elite. And you have people who have Forget people who have one. And for, for all the questions today, I primarily want to focus on people who have more than one house, two to five to mm -hmm. 15. And my question is like, do you think real estate investors, not people who want to own a home, real estate investors should sell off some of their homes to buy Bitcoin? Now, and we're talking about liquidate. We say you got 10 houses, you should liquidate a X percentage of them and you should just flat out buy Bitcoin. Is that a strategy that you recommend generally? I know there's exceptions here or there. Mm -hmm. It is, and it's highly correlated to the amount of hours spent studying Bitcoin. Because if it's only because the price goes up of Bitcoin, so I think I need it, then I, you know I'm not too warm on the idea. But if they've studied beyond 10 hours, like if you're into Bitcoin for 50 and 100 hours, 
then absolutely, because you understand the volatility and you understand how Bitcoin operates, that this thing might be very volatile and it might be an asset that goes up and down in fiat dollar price, but it's not going to scare you out of it. But yes, if you've done the work and you don't have any allocation to Bitcoin and you have 10 income properties, then yes, you should be allocating to Bitcoin, in my opinion. But absolutely, there's a member of the Rockstar team here who did, ju did just that. So I think I'm on the front lines of seeing the, you know, definancialization of real estate because there are, he's an investor. He owns multiple properties in the range that you're talking about. He sold one of his properties, I guess it's been about five months ago now, to acquire Bitcoin. So let me ask, Okay, so let me ask this. So that's a, that's a use case. And he's happy with that, with, with that choice. Five months ago, seems like he's doing okay, crab market. Um, but he made that that leap of faith in 2024. And you're saying that he's okay with that, with that move. Okay. Now, what about, now you have 10 houses and you're like, you know, let's just say that, let's just say that you have 10 houses, five of them are paid off fully. You're just collecting rent on them. Mm -hmm. You're collecting, you know, it's a steady stream of income, uh, all you're doing is paying maintenance costs. Now, I'm not, you know, my mom's a realtor and we could talk about my my story if we have time, but I believe you can take equity out of houses that you own either, either partially or fully. And so you could essentially create another loan against a house that you own, is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay, so is there, now when you have that situation, do you recommend people taking leverage um, and taking basically taking equity out of a home to buy Bitcoin. And then and after you answer that question, compare the two choices, compare the two financial decisions, selling a house outright, just saying I'm done with X percentage of those houses, 20, 50% of those houses. And then compare, it's like, I'm going to keep those X amount of houses and, but I'm going to let the bank own a little portion of it so I can get the money up front and allocate it to Bitcoin. What are your thoughts? Yeah, if you have a fully paid off um, rental property, you're only getting the 7% appreciation. You're not outpacing inflation. So you need income to live. So that's great that you're generating income from that rental property. But I wouldn't say that you're outpacing the financial debasement that's going on around you. So I think you should highly consider refinancing one of those properties, taking on some leverage and buying Bitcoin with that. Um, a lot of people don't like that answer, but I, I think that that's a smart move. The, the, so if you have houses that are paid off, to me, you're, they're, you're, they're generating income, but you're not getting ahead financially. Um, I would, you're basically doing a mini, a mini Michael Saylor. You're, you're, you're taking on some debt, you're using that debt to acquire Bitcoin. As long as the income from the property covers your new debt load comfortably, whatever that means to your life, then yeah, absolutely. It's an absolute no brainer to me. Now, as far as selling one of your properties outright to acquire the Bitcoin, so now not leveraging it, but selling it outright. The reason I think you should consider some of that is that never before has there been a time where I think jurisdictional risk is something that you need to consider as, a, as an individual and if you want to be a sovereign individual of any sort. Because if you have all of your real estate in Los Angeles or in California or in the US or in Canada or in the Toronto area, you are introducing some jurisdictional risk to your life. And never before have we been able to own an asset that you can move around globally as e easily as Bitcoin. And the reason I like that is some of my family's histories, as I described earlier, of what they've been through, ju having jurisdictional you know, freedom with some of your assets is something we didn't have before. You could have gold in your pocket, maybe. And I know people who escaped a war in Bosnia by paying the church a little bit of gold to help them smuggle them outside the country during a war. Like I do know, you know, that's what they did use to get out of that country. But never before have we had an asset. So it's something that I don't think the majority of the population has ever considered before. Can I own an asset that doesn't have jurisdictional risk? Yes, you have to declare it in the country you bought it in. And I'm not trying to say circumvent all the tax laws in the country, but I'd, it at least gives me the opportunity to have some mobility that maybe I didn't have before with some of my asset base. So that's why I think you should probably, if you have no Bitcoin, reduce some of your jurisdictional risk and allocate some percentage of a real estate portfolio to Bitcoin with outright sales of the property. You know, we talk about jurisdictional arbitrage, jurisdic minimizing jurisdictional risk. 
Um, again, and you know, when you when you go into well, why, why, why? You know, we're we're marching down these these very dangerous paths of where the globalists are very wanting to be globalized, and the anti-globalists are saying, "Hell no, we won't go." And we're seeing what looks like you know war is brewing. War is already brewing again in the Middle East. It's been brewing uh, in the in the Slavic regions for couple years now where we thought it would be six months it's now two it's going to be three years it's not going to be done until we hope at the beginning of next year but probably not and then you see you hear you know Kamala Harris you know during the during the debate saying we have no troops in you know anywhere on on the front lines and of course you know troops pop up and you know making TikTok videos saying that what where the hell are we <laughs> and then and then as soon as that debate is over we you know little tiny news blips that are you know here and gone saying you know they deploy 700 troops here you know you're deploying 700 troops there east eastern europe and the middle east and so basically what we're seeing is tensions rising and for that reason there's but tensions are rising I think when we think about the west when we think about western europe when we think about canada and the us tensions are always rising over there. That's why we're so okay with saying, yeah, yeah, you know, support Ukraine. Yeah, bloodshed, because we're we're 4,000 miles away, 8,000 miles away. We don't get to see, touch, feel, hear those things going on. Maybe you're a little, maybe your stance is a little different if you're in Croatia, um, where you can hear things, where you can see jets flying. Um, so my question is, based on your understanding of Gl the globe and cultures elsewhere. Um, do you see that similar jurisdictional risk awareness of people <clears throat> that are closer to areas that are uh, a little less uh, less stable? Like Canadians say, like, oh yeah, I can own all my houses in Toronto. Does does someone in Croatia think the same? Does someone in Ukraine think the same uh, that I'm going to own? all 12 of my houses and five houses in the Donbas region. Like, it's like, you know, it's kind of wild. Like what's your, what's your perspective on jurisdictional risk in other parts of the globe? Yeah. I think people get it outside the West much faster. Like my cousins who are in Croatia understand currency and currency debasement much, much deeper than Canadians do. My Canadian friends do. So I think your perspective matters a lot. And I feel like Canadians and Americans have been so sheltered and lived a great life for many decades now that they don't see it. So like when I explain Bitcoin to some of my cousins, they get it so much faster because in their recent history, you know, the DNR hyperinflated in the 1990s there which I guess sounds like a long time ago now, but in, in the memory of the population and the families in that area, the 1990s to go through a complete hyperinflation where the dinar is eliminated from existence, that's pretty recent. So because they have that in their the back of their minds, they're very aware mm. of these things and not putting all their eggs in one basket. And they're very skeptical of whatever the government says in any government currency. These are the things that are normal. Here in Canada, that did change with the Freedom Convoy and the truckers in Ottawa. That was the first time Canadians got to see a government in Canada shut down people's bank accounts in this country. And that brought it to top of mind for some people for the first time ever in this country. And because of that, I think some Canadians are more aware of a jurisdictional risk or a government risk that if the government wants to clamp down on you, they can. And I'm not sure if everyone listening to this would would you know remember what happened, but the Canadian government shut down the bank accounts of some people with no judicial process. They just said, hey, you're at this protest and we've deemed it illegal and we are now shutting the bank account down that you pay your rent and buy your groceries. So that was the first time I think in this country that it came top of mind. But I, I do think we are entering a world that the natural state of the fiat system perpetuates some of these things to the point where we are going to get more war, we are going to get more debasement. And the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that you don't have to be upper middle class anymore to buy an asset that can help you protect yourself against it. You could buy $10 of this stuff, $100 of this stuff. And when I just think of my aunt who was, listen, my aunt in Croatia at one point, she was buying at the end of the sea, construction season before the winter, it would get down to like plus five there and they would stop con some construction. She would pick up little bars of rebar, you know, the metal, the steel that you put in cement to pour the cement to make it strong. There would be little scraps of that around. She would pick it up at the end of the season and 
then she would sell it at the beginning of the next construction season. And this is the way that she was trying to protect her purchasing power. She'd pick up scraps. She would buy for cheap little scraps that people didn't want and then sell it. Like this is the kind of thing she needed to do. Whereas now somebody in Toronto, LA, New York, you can pick up $5, $10, $100 of Bitcoin and it could be yours forever. So yeah, we, we're like, we're watching the end of one dollar system, one system, monetary system kind of unwind. And we're watching the birth of this new system. And many people are going to miss some of that, unfortunately, until it's a little bit too late. But I guess, I guess Ulrich, it exists. So I'm happy yeah. to exist. You know, it's funny that you say that. I mean, in Argentina, there, there have been use cases where people were stacking, were buying bricks um, to... I think it was is either Argentina or another very very um, horrible currency system uh, domain. But they would buy bricks, um, take whatever fiat they had, buy bricks, and continually buy bricks. And that's how they would essentially either build a house or sell those bricks to someone else who wants to build a house. Because bricks, the cost of one brick would essentially hold its value better than the local currency. And so when you talk about the <laughs> the steel, the, the metal shards, metal shards holding its value better than the government sponsored currency. And we and people who are educated, people who are who have their they show their I have a college degree, they can't see the forest for the trees. It's like, don't you do you not see the mathematical imbalance? Do you not see that one thing is like a melting ice cube and another thing that isn't money is better money than that metal shards of brick. And then, and then on top of that, we get the, yeah. And then on top of that, like we get the misallocation of capital. So like I used to work in tech, my brother used to work in tech and now we started rockstar real estate. There's like 40 of us here. Why should there be 40 people working at rockstar real estate, helping people buy rental properties? Like why should rockstar even need to exist? Like our business shouldn't need to exist. Our business is a reflection on the misallocation of capital. Like when we have middle-class families, anyone who comes in to see us, they're trying to outpace the debasement. They don't want to be a landlord. They don't want to buy a rental property they have in to. Hamilton. They have to. And then we're here to support them through that process to help them because it's a tricky game. You're dealing with, you know, the banks and tenants and maintenance and costs and overhead. And there's all these things to consider. So it's not like it's the easiest thing, but nobody, nobody is walking in here, like really jumping up and down, excited, saying they want to become a real estate investor. So not only do you have a misallocation of capital, we're taking all this capital and putting into real estate that is making the housing crisis even worse. Let's face it. Um, it is producing some rental property, so we could probably argue that a little bit back and forth, but th there is misallocation of capital. But what about all the brain power that's in here? And I'm not trying to say, Ulrich, that we're like the smartest group of people, but if you have 40 hardworking people in here, wouldn't the brain power of 40 people be better directed in some other capacity to help our community or our society instead of focusing on which property and what area has the best cap rate and how to reduce maintenance and how to deal with the landlord tenant board and how to manage leases and do all this stuff? Like, what are we doing? And, and if I extrapolate that forward across the country of Canada, how much misallocation of, of capital is happening with people selling insurance policies that we don't need, but we just need because we're trying to protect ourselves against future, future, uh, future debasement? How many people are in the financial industry on Bay Street here, which is our Wall Street, and spending time in that industry that really, if we could just save money and that money go up in value, our brain powers could be unleashed on sub, such better things in society that helps our community directly. It When you kind of look behind the curtain on this, it is kind of rather ridiculous, you know? So uh, we joke that our business shouldn't exist. Like we're happy it exists. We're happy to be here and help people. But at this point, we look at our business as a gateway to Bitcoin. We get people to understand real estate. We teach them that interest rates are the greatest threat greatest variable that you have to manage with real estate. We then educate people on the, the central banking system controls those interest rates on a willy nilly basis, right? They just kind of hit the keyboards or, or move the magical dial and decide what the cost of money is going to be. And then when you understand that, you realize you can escape that system with Bitcoin. So at this point, you know, for us, it's, this is a little bit of a Trojan horse business where we're trying to introduce Bitcoin through real estate.
It's interesting because uh, with my day job, and I don't like to talk about my day job too much, but essentially it's a it's a new way of systems engineering. Uh, it's called model based systems engineering. The idea is that is that the way people have built systems, uh, whether it's a satellite, whether it's a missile, whether it's a jet fighter, the way they've they've the, the engineering steps, almost like the scientific method to building these things is lethargic, it's slow, it's rudimentary, it's uh, paper-based, um, and shifting that process into a digital environment um, requires, requires tension, requires teaching old dogs new tricks. And essentially my boss, who I really like, I share his, his worldviews a lot, um, and we talk about politics and stuff, I try to be, get him oh, into shit. Bitcoin, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, you know, and he's, we're all, we're all on the same page except for the Bitcoin thing, but he's learning. He's like, oh yeah, you know, I told someone at a conference that you're, you're a Bitcoin guy. And it's like, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks boss. And he's, he said, our job is to essentially make our job non-existent because in the future, he would say that everyone is a model-based systems engineer as opposed to a slow paper engineer. So it's like you guys in this real estate job, you're not trying to even though you are making a living and you're helping people out, your real mission is to create a world where you no longer exist. And I think yeah. that's brilliant because then all the realtors can go create value in other ways because they're brilliant people. And it's just that we are the incentives of people greater than us. And I, this is a little bit of a Cantillon effect. It protects itself so well for hundreds of years. It's creating a dynamic that that pulls value away from essentially the value creators. You know, when you're built, when you're building a house, and you we're talking about moving from one brick to another, building, building, um, creating value exchange that help people progress in humanity. Those value there are value creators and there are value siphoners or st or or thieves or taxers and it's like those taxers those own the owning class the taxing class they're they're looking to maintain their ownership of society without actually contributing to it and <clears throat> in my opinion the real estate system uh, a layer on top of the fiat system is uh, is a culprit in it now. Okay, that was my monologue. I do want to get back to a certain another use case that um, that I didn't mention. You well, you kind of talked about it before. You talked about um, cash flows, rental income, um, and of course, people can uh, people earn a living by being basically landlords. And my question is, that's another possible way to um, to get into Bitcoin by just hey allocating a portion of your cash. Uh, into Bitcoin. If so, what is the determining factor of how much they should do that? Is it just a matter of just being able to live or your risk your risk profile? What what are some of the things that you talk about when people consider their their stream of rental income and just putting into Bitcoin? That means no leverage, that means no selling houses, just the, just the rental income. Yeah. So for investors, we always talk about having an emergency fund should something pop up on the property. So, you know, if it's a single family home, maybe you want $5,000 that you accumulate in the cash flows of the property so that if a furnace goes bad or a roof goes bad, you have some immediate cash where you can fix the property and the tenants aren't left in a bad situation with the property. So you kind of build up that cash reserve on the property on a single family home in this area, $5,000 seems to work as a kind of magical number. And then beyond that, once you've built that up and the cash flow comes in, whatever you don't need for your current life to live, like the groceries or to pay your own rent or your own mortgage or whatever, to us, you should be saving that money. And to, to us, that means allocating to Bitcoin. So we, we tell everybody now the way we're operating our lives and our business and our properties is that we have a dollar figure that we need for operational capital for this business. Once that is met, all all other income streams that come in get swept into Bitcoin. So it should be the same thing we believe for your rental properties. When the cash flows come in, whatever you need to live, fine. But if you're, you know, if you you're fortunate enough to have cash flows where you are have more than you need to live, sweep all of that into Bitcoin. 
And that's the best savings account that you can have. So a real estate investor who is, you know, has some cash flows, that's kind of what we're advising. And most people just don't quite understand that. They still get caught up in the volatility and the price of Bitcoin. So that to them, that seems a difficult thing to, to understand. So we've begun speaking to people in four year terms and we just say, Hey, listen, look over the four year cycle of Bitcoin. And I know this is kind of common now, especially for, you know, Bitcoiners to, to talk this way, but to these people, it's, 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 it's a little bit enlightening. And we say if, over any four year cycle, the worst four year compound annual growth rate is going to be around 24%. And the higher ones, you know, the last four years is right now sitting at about 50% or so, depending on the day and the price. Um, and if you can live with that and who can't, then sweep all your excess savings into Bitcoin and you're just going to live a happy life. You have productive property because the thing with real estate is that the financialization of real estate is likely going to change over time um, in that the, the dollar prices maybe won't appreciate quite as high as they have. And we you kind of have to argue that a little bit based on how much new dollars and debasement comes in. But against Bitcoin, we, you know, we know the dollar price uh, against Bitcoin, the price isn't going to do too great, but maybe the dollar price keeps going up. But rental property is still a business. The customer lives in your home. There's income that comes in, there's expenses. So there's always going to be a need for rental property. It's not like rental properties are going to go away. And this is what I, I try to tell some Bitcoiners. I'm like, look, there's still going to be a need. There's always going to be a need for rental property. So maybe the financialization of it is going to decrease. But if you can evaluate a property today based on its income and expenses and live with that, that strategy is likely going to work fairly well for a very long time. Now, the price on top of it, remember I, I mentioned those Hamilton properties, they might not go from 200,000 to 850,000 or 1.1 million in a decade. Um, but the income and expenses, as long as you're evaluating properties that way, it's going to continue. And Ulrich, I just want to share one other thing just to, uh, about Bitcoin and, and real estate. What we tell people is that you need some assets to retire, like you're going to need some assets to retire. But the beautiful part with Bitcoin is that if that money appreciates in dollar terms over time, what it does to you is that you don't have to worry about maintaining your properties. You don't have to be worrying about dealing with tenants when you're in your 60s and your 70s. And you're going to just have this base of savings that the purchasing power continues to go up and up and up on you. And it's going to produce a better retirement for you. So that if you don't want to deal with properties when you're in your later years, start allocating to Bitcoin now. And there's going to be a beautiful mix of real estate income and long-term savings that is going to serve you really well into retirement. And then if I take a step beyond that to the bigger picture of what Bitcoin represents for all of us is that when I had my great-grandfather uh, great in a village over there in Croatia, the whole village took care of him. He didn't have to worry about retirement. Because the village took care of him. Like he, when he got to like a hundred years old, like he would get up and like sit on a log all day. Like that's what he did. That was his day. <laughs> but the whole village like fed him and make sure he got to bed and took care of him. We've lost that in modern society. And in modern society today, we have a retirement generation that is worried, so worried about affording the next month's rent that they can't really participate in the community and society to give back their wisdom. Like right now in the Toronto area, I meet so many older people who are so worried about paying next month's rent as a retired person or paying for next month's groceries as a retired person. They can't live. They're just obsessed with, you know, trying to survive another month on their fixed income. But if we had a Bitcoin standard where Bitcoin becomes everybody's base savings and the purchasing power of that goes up in value over time. We are going to gain back our wise elders and our wise elders in the community to me have been lost. How many people do you know who even sit down and respect elderly people anymore and learn from them? That's gone. But over hundreds of years of history, we've always had that, but that's a symptom of fiat that that's gone. And I believe Bitcoin could bring that back. So with retirement, I believe in a broader picture that Bitcoin can make the return of the wise elder back into our society and the wise elder can take care of the kids and teach the kids and take care of the family and guide the family and can produce a better community for all of us. So I know I'm talking a little bit pie in the sky right now because that might take some time, but that's the trend that I see that we're on and it's beautiful to me. 
You know, it's very interesting that you say that because, yeah, our time is essentially stolen um, by this system. And the funny thing, the system has promised, don't worry, the government is, will essentially take care of you. And we can go back to Lyndon Johnson with uh, with his approach to to blacks in the in the seventies. I think that was a, a lot of a lot of people who have been awakened to uh, how fiat has impacted um, minorities. I think they can point back to what Lyndon Johnson uh, and his program and I forget the the details, but essentially the government becomes like this surrogate parent. Mm -hmm. And so what you do with, because that happens, this surrogate parent essentially starts determining because it's like this, this machine that must survive by any means necessary, almost this utilitarian thing, this greater good, the greatest good ends up discarding things that individuals will say, no, wait, that's important. And a lot of these individuals, these localities, for the locality, the the great good is are these wise elders, mm -hmm. um, because this great centralized authority. We don't need that wise elder anymore because we have the central bank and we have the capital. Yeah, and so in the money, the incentives of this massive economy, um, it shifts people's attention away from the local wise elder. So what you see there, instead of giving money to or giving resources so that the elder can survive because they won't have to worry about anything because breakfast will be there for them. Oh, they're going to be able to go to this restaurant and hang out and they'll get free, you know, free lunch, whatever. And all of a sudden their, their, their days are taken care of as they take care of the younger generations. What you end up seeing is those elders are actually a, a parasite uh, mm -hmm. or a, or a, a problem that yeah, needs to be burden. Dis yeah. discarded. And you know, that's a when and not to get weird, but that that lends itself to Nazism. You know, Nazis mm -hmm. were all about, you know, getting, you know, absolutely discarding the inefficient, the you know, essentially euthanizing the the things that that the government sees as not important. The Spartans discarded babies that were considered that were considered, you know, not going to be a part of the the warrior class because they were like, uh, it's worthless. We throw this one away. Um, uh, fiat essentially makes us disregard human life even more so. Why? Because with the energy that we have, we have to pay the taxes to keep that fiat system afloat. But when Bitcoin, but because of Bitcoin and because it demonetizes those that big giant centralized construct it brings us back to our localities to see what's actually important and what's important is goes back to the individual the crusoean economics that individual value exchange one to one talks about you know then you can start getting to martin luther king you know judge not by the color of the skin content of their character the individual is assessed by what the individual does and every single person is different and every single person can be assessed differently because we are smaller in our in our in our actions so again we can go on and on about that i think it's very important that that example that you brought up and a lot of people are blinded to that because we have been living in this essentially this dollar standard this fiat standard for so long i was born in it people that you were born in it people who are older than us you know they had a glimpse of it it's a shame and we're trying to fight for that back yeah, I tell there's a, there's a young guy here that uh, he, he he around the Toronto area there was a lot of Italian immigrants that came in the Toronto area and they all bought land all around Toronto and they sat on that land and people kind of made fun of them like why are you buying all this land around Toronto and then Toronto grows and those people became very rich <laughs> okay and there's a, this young millennial that works with us and he's always complaining about yeah you know, I shouldn't say he's always complaining but he's always pointing out the boomers the boomers this boomers that and I tell him but he's a Bitcoiner. And I tell him, you're the old Italian guy. You're the young version. You're buying Bitcoin. That's the equivalent to the farmland that was outside the city. And you're just sitting on it. And 20 years from now, people are going to point at you and say, you're the old boomer, but you're going to have some purchasing power. Amazing. <laughs> so he's just doing the right thing. He's complaining, but he doesn't, he doesn't realize right now he is that old guy who's just accumulating that farmland. That farmland ha happens to be digital, pristine farmland in the form of Bitcoin. So he's on the right path. Anyway, Lord, that's right. And farmland, 
and farmland that you that's that's weightless that you can carry with you and you can exchange as as easy as a as an electronic dollar on totally. Venmo. It's and now amazing. I tell him he's not allowed to complain. I'm like, you, you, you know, and he, he knows it. He knows it's true. He's like, oh my gosh, yeah, that is true. That is going to happen to me. And I'm like, see, can't complain anymore. <laughs> Speaking about what's going to happen, I think we're under, I think we're in consensus that Bitcoin is going to win. It's just a matter of when it wins uh, and it's winning right now. But we all have this idea in the future, which is some people call hyper Bitcoinization. Um, so, my last question, and then you go off, you know, and, you know, rant, rant on it as you want, and then we can be done. But like, what does the future look like when Bitcoin is won? And you, we've talked about some of those things, but maybe build upon that if you want. And then if you believe that Bitcoin has won in, say, 10 years or 20 years from a real estate perspective as well, because let's bring it back to your profession. What does that look like from a from a an asset allocation standpoint. Let's let's just say Bitcoin has just won and like you're on the precipice and like you allocated properly. Like what does it look like from a Bitcoin to real estate allocation? How much what percentage are are people owning one home and then just everything Bitcoin? Are people owning, yeah, we I I live in this home but I also rent this one out or I have a few houses in different places because of, you know, world may blow up in this place but not over there. That's a compound question, but again, what, is, what does the future look like when Bitcoin is won? And what does the individual look like from their own sovereign individuality from a real estate to Bitcoin allocation perspective? Yeah, wow. I, I guess, so I guess I would define Bitcoin winning, and I, I, I probably changed my answer, but um, when it's big, it's a currently a trillion dollar market measured in dollar terms. When Bitcoin is bigger than the, the US treasury market, the bond, the basically the the size of the bond, the global bond market, which is currently like 300 trillion or whatever it is. I guess when Bitcoin is in dollar terms bigger than that in today's dollars, um, I would think that when it's bigger than the bond market in value, it's one. Um, and I think we're on that path. So that's kind of how I would define um, Bitcoin winning. Um, I'm just hesitating because they're like, there's so many ways that you can answer that question. But I think when it, when the, if the base of the current system is U S treasuries and bonds, that's the base of a current debt based system. Once Bitcoin is larger than that in purchasing power, Bitcoin has one, which means it has multiples to go. Um, and then once Bitcoin has one, and I do believe we're, we're on that path, um, real estate it becomes just something you need like food. Like you don't buy a steak and sit on that ribeye hoping that it goes up in value so that you can like protect some purchasing power. Like you don't buy groceries genuinely to protect your purchasing power. Like food is a need, but you buy what you need and you kind of move on. You buy just what you need and you kind of move on. I think real estate takes on that utility. It's just like, oh, well, like I need a place to live. Maybe I'll rent or maybe I'll buy. And I just buy the slice of real estate that I need. And I don't need more than, you know, I don't need to buy 10 or 15 homes to protect my purchasing power. Like it's just, it just becomes really this utility thing. And maybe you're not even tied to it in an area as much as we are now. Like I'll buy something here. I want to move to Miami. I sell it here. I buy something in Miami to live there for a little bit. And it's not, you, you, there's no, preconceived notion that like, oh, you shouldn't sell your property in Toronto if you're moving to Miami because the Toronto one will keep going up in value. It's just like, I'm done with Toronto, sell Toronto, buy in Miami. So I, there's still going to be real estate transact. Like that's not going away. I just feel like it'll be a much more utilitarian kind of approach to it. Like buy what you need, just like you buy your groceries that you need. If some people are able to be, uh, you know, have more purchasing power than others, some people buy the ribeye, some people buy the hot dogs, I guess it'll be like that in real estate. Some people will buy a smaller property and some people will buy the Miami coastline, you know, whatever it's going to be, there'll be some change to it, but it'll just be a utility thing. And, uh, um, and then living in this Bitcoin world is going to be beautiful because I think what it'll allow people to, it will give people the opportunity to focus their work and their lives on the things that they are truly passionate about. And usually when you focus on things you're passionate about, you're going to bring a lot of effort around it. And I think humans are going to flourish in that 
type of environment because right now we have people trapped in all kinds of horrible jobs sitting in cubicles that they hate working in a financial system that doesn't allow them to think dream even you know take a vacation and i just feel on a bitcoin standard when you know that if you offer value to the world you're going to be able to save that in the best most pristine form of capital that we've ever seen in the history of humankind it is going to produce a future that is really going to be beautiful for all of us because Ulrich can do what he wants in his community. I can do what I want in my community and we can serve instead of feeling like you have to take to get ahead. So I feel like it's going to be a reversal where we're all going to be serving each other and expressing our best selves in the community and offering value. And you're not going to have companies that like, you're not going to have real estate like in Toronto, you just have condos that are being built that are boxes in the sky and they're really kind of ugly. They're like a one bedroom condo. They kind of are horrible places to live after that. You know, when you're young from your twenties, thirties, maybe they're fun. Then they're like not even nice places to live in anymore. I think it's going to put pressure on things like real estate to produce beautiful places to live that people are going to be proud of for their whole lives. And you're not going to just be able to put a box in the sky and sell it to the masses. Whereas with the financialization of the current system, that's what you can do because people just grab at any real estate knowing or thinking that the price will go up forever. So there's no thought put into it. Whereas I think there's going to be some thoughtfulness have put back into things like real estate. So we're going to see better properties, more sustainable properties, better properties to live in all because of Bitcoin. Ulrich, I'm kind of going, you know, gave me a lot to think about there. So I'm, I'm just kind of that's, going on in circles. That's a bit. my job. And I yeah. don't think that that was circles at all. I think that I, I think that you gave a very objective answer of when Bitcoin wins. And of course, people are going to say, you know, the cheerleaders are going to, <laughs> cheerleaders, you know, it's like the rah rah people buy Bitcoin now. It's like, it's like, you know, chill out, you know, it's like sell, sell everything, but sell your chairs. It's like, I don't, I don't like that, that narrative it, it's it's sin it sounds very uh uh zealous religious zealot kind of thing you know we're all here to make ourselves better we're all here to to the when we wake up the next day we want to be better off than we were the day before and i think what you did you you gave an objective answer of the use cases for people in hyper bitcoinization when essentially hyper bitcoinization is is like, hey, we're here now. We're on a Bitcoin standard. I think it's a, it's great. Whatever is the reserve uh, currency of the day, whenever those, whenever Bitcoin passes that market cap in treasuries, uh, essentially Bitcoin is either won or is the chief asset of the world, and will likely continue to just get better and better because it's like, okay, now that it's past the U.S. dollar, let's just say the dollar stays in, in power. 300 trillion, let's just say 600 trillion in the future when it passes it. Guess what? All the other, all the other central banks and the people who play in treasuries are going to say, oh my gosh, this is actually it. And it's just going, it's going to catapult even further. So you see, you go from, you know, 300 trillion to 600 trillion, one quadrillion, because it's like yeah, every exactly. country has their own treasury <laughs> yeah. and it's going to ramp up. And then on top, now you start to talk about the monetary premium of these assets where we're used to seeing, hey, a house is money. It's a storage of value use case. And we start pulling that away. It's like, it's not as much of a store of value as I thought I need because Bitcoin is all I need and better. It's it's faster, smarter, stronger than a house. What does that do to the value of the house? Most people are buying a house because they want to, we want to preserve our, our wealth. You broke that down. I think that's a great uh construct and what you what you laid out toronto miami guess what I sell that buy that it's going to be easier you won't need 40 people at your company you'll <laughs> you'll only need four or three or one with all the ai and technology that we have and all those 39 other people can go touch grass mm -hmm. work with the with work with the elders of the of the community um yeah it's a, it's yes. a beautiful thing yeah so, agreed I want to respect your time. This has been a great, a great opportunity to talk with you. Finally, um, Tom Karadza. Um, Thanks, Ulrich. Co-founder of Rockstar Real Estate. Yeah, man. Uh, and if one thing, you know, I, I'm half of the people that I interview now because I'm associated with this Canadian company. I'm from LA. I never talk to Canadians. <laughs> 
I'm like, you know, David Bradley, you know, uh, John, uh, BTC Sessions has to come on some point. You, it's like even the Northern Northern Americans with uh, North, like Minnesota, with Brandon Quittum, like there's a certain dynamic of your guys' recognition of what property is dealing with and how, and something that maybe Americans are just, maybe it's the, prop, the propaganda machine, maybe it's the mainstream media, but you guys are really, you guys are able to kind of sift through the noise a little easier than Americans. I think you guys are going to be leading this Bitcoin revolution. Uh, I think you guys already are, honestly. I'm, 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 it's a privilege to be associated with all of you. So anyways. Cool. Thank, thank you for the thank it. you for being on the show. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Again, that's Tom Tom Car Carradza. Again, he's his name is difficult like mine. It's like I have it's like how do you say Ulrich Patillo? Okay. It's it's Patillo, not Patillo. It's Carradza, not Cardadza. Um, but he's he's been a brilliant host and I mean a brilliant guest. And I think the real estate use case is very important for people who, again, anyone who's trying to preserve their wealth, they need houses now but in the future what we'll see is the the real estate monetary premium will go down as people recognize the power of bitcoin uh mom this episode is definitely for you all right i'm sir ulrich like my father before me tune in next time when i bring on another brilliant bitcoin guest